Hey guys, it's Tiana, and today we're talking about film photography. I hope you enjoyed this guy. You thought I wasn't gonna talk about that thing on my eye? What? You thought I was just gonna keep going? You thought I just wasn't gonna say nothing about it? Mmm, do you see that thing? Do you see that thing? That is a demonic, that is something possessing my soul. And we're gonna try to do something about it, so please just bear with me. Thank you. <laughs> I know when I started, it was really overwhelming learning everything. I wanted to make this guide for people who are starting with film, or need a refresher, or want to move from point and shoot to SLR. Let's dive in. So first of all, we have disposable cameras, which um, are the worst for the environment. They're cost effective if you're just going to use them once. And it's nice because they can handle a lot of wear. The nice thing about a disposable is that it's entirely automatic. You can get a waterproof disposable. So if you're doing something underwater and you don't want to go through all the trouble of like getting an underwater rig, then just like, then like, yeah, like they're handy, but but like we can do better. Next up, we have 35 millimeter point and shoots. Um, they're fantastic. There's a lot of different kinds of 35 millimeter point and shoots. Like this one is just fully automatic with a flash, whereas this one has more settings. It's got a zoom lens. It's got a bunch of features on the back, like. Portrait, auto, there's a cell timer. This one I find also has like nicer pictures. It's just like smarter about exposure. This one I got from a friend, so it was free. At Value Village you can find ones exactly like it for like 12 bucks. But point and shoots can range from anywhere from free to literally like $400. So it just kind of depends what kind of clout you're looking for. <laughs> Point and shoots are great for people who really want to get into film but can't be bothered to learn all the manual settings, which is totally understandable. It's much easier, spur of the moment, to just be like, when you're shooting point and shoot, I definitely recommend using your flash as much as you can, just so that you don't risk camera shake or um, underexposure. Six out of the 10 pictures I take with a point and shoot without flash turn out shaky or Exposed, so I definitely recommend not taking those chances. I found this film camera on Kijiji. There's a lot of people who collect point and shoots just for resale, so if you find any of those kinds of people, let your friends know. Thank you. When I use point and shoot, I usually just get Kodak Ultramax 36 um, because it's cheap as dirt and it gets a great image but ultramax is about a third of the price of more professional film rolls so choose your battles there's a point and shoot for everyone out there i recommend everyone have a point and shoot because they're just handy way to shoot film whenever you want next there's range finders which are fun because they're a bit more manual you can get into more manual settings i'm not i'm not a huge fan of range finders for me the whole focusing mechanism is a little bit mm, not ideal because what happens is there is a ghost image on top of your image in the viewfinder and you know it's in focus when the ghost image overlaps the actual image perfectly and uh yeah, to each their own. I will honorably mention 110 film. They were made with the purpose of being able to fit in your pocket, but the film is much smaller and you don't get a better result. And it's just overall more expensive. So but most camera shops still have the chemistry to process it. So instead of shooting this, you can just cross process your 35. And it's pretty cute. Can I get a drum roll please? For, can I please get a drum roll for SLRs? This isn't the camera, this is a bag. SLRs. And we can all tell 
just by looking at it, you just know that she's the real deal. So this is my Minolta X700 with her telephoto lens. Another really popular one is the Canon AE1. Um, but really anything by Minolta, Canon, Leica, Pentax is gonna get you through. SLRs are great because you get the most creative freedom when you're taking a picture. Um, you can get some really high quality images and you can get some really beautiful bouquets. SLRs have interchangeable lenses, so you can change your lens based on the situation, based on if it's a portrait or a landscape. All film cameras have their own way of capturing light, so starting a collection is not a bad idea. All my cameras capture light in a different way, and I love them all for different situations. So maybe you're all like, but why not just take a digital image? Big brain. Like I have a phone. I might even have a DSLR or even just a digital point of shoot. Yes, your digital images are HD and they're beautiful and crispy, but photography is supposed to tell a story and make you feel something. And with film, it's just inherently more sentimental. And to me, there's no more genuine or authentic way to take a picture than through an analog process. With digital photography, your picture is translated into zeros and ones, whereas with film photography, it's more like capturing an aura with chemistry, and I like to think it's magical. Moving on, here's five settings you should know before taking your first film photograph. Number one is ISO. It's good to be familiar with ISO or ASA when it comes to every type of film camera because even on an automatic camera you need to set it to expose for whatever number ISO film you're using. ISO is what tells you how sensitive your film is going to be to light. So the lower the number, the less sensitive it will be to light. There's a lot of types of film you can choose to shoot on. Usually I shoot on 400, but if I know I'm going to be shooting in mostly daylight, I'll go with 200. 100 is a good choice if you know you're only going to be shooting in the daylight. And if you know you're more of a night owl, you could do 800 ISO. Number two is shutter speed. SLRs will usually have a light meter inside of them that will tell you what to set your shutter speed to based on your aperture and ISO settings. To activate the light meter, you just need to half press the shutter button. My Minolta goes from 1 to 1000 shutter speed. 1000 being the fastest, and 1 being the slowest. When you shoot under 60, you risk having a shaky image, so try to shoot over that whenever you can. With automatic cameras, keep in mind that if there's not enough light, it will compensate by having a slower shutter speed, and so you are going to want to add more light, use your flash, so that you don't get a blurry image. On my SLR, there is the P setting that automatically sets the aperture and the shutter. And then I have the A setting, which automatically sets the shutter. I have a B setting that allows me to press the shutter down and the shutter will stay open until I release it, making shutter speeds over one second possible. I haven't used that yet. Number three is aperture. Aperture is important to know because it controls your depth of field how shallow or how far your focus is going to be. So the smaller the number, the wider the aperture, the more light hits the sensor, and the shallower the depth of field. Which is a lot of words. <laughs> Basically, if you want it shallow, use a little number. If you want it far, use a big one. <laughs> so the larger the f-stop number, the smaller the aperture, the less, less light hits the sensor, and the farther the depth of field. Okay? So a large aperture needs a faster shutter speed to maintain the exposure. On fixed lens point and shoots and disposable cameras, the focal distance will be set for you already, and it's usually between 3 feet to 10 feet. Um, but if you're going to shoot a subject over 4 feet away, I would recommend using your flash or making sure it's really well lit so, <laughs> so that the photo turns out. It just works better that way. Number four is focus. I already went over focusing on a rangefinder. And I don't really I don't really want to talk about her. 
Most SLRs will have a spot in the middle of the viewfinder that will appear broken until it's in focus. And on mine, it just looks in focus when it's in focus. But it's a nice added reassurance. The focal distance is measured in feet, so you can take out your measuring tape if you're not sure and have a friend go from the subject to your camera. Number five is exposure. And when your exposure, what? On manual cameras, you can play with the exposure. I mean, I don't ever use it, but if you think it's too dark, you can turn it up. And if you think it's too light, you can turn it down. But it's useful to note that it's better to overexpose than to underexpose with film because in an overexposed image, you can still bring back that information in post, whereas with an underexposed one, the information just isn't there at all. Now I have some more tips for your film endeavors. The sunny 16 rule is handy to know when you're shooting midday or when it's really sunny out. You can set your f-stop to 16, and then from there, you can match your shutter speed to your ISO. So if I was shooting 200 ISO, then I would set my shutter speed to 250 because that's as close as I can get. To improve the accuracy of your exposure, you can use a handheld light meter. You can hold the light meter right in front of your subject's face or whatever your subject is and expose for that spot exactly. I'll put a link to more information about that below. You can also get an external flash for your SLR. My Minolta came as a kit with another lens and the flash, so that was really lucky. And I don't remember how much it was, it might have even just been $150. So you can save a lot of money, initially, with film. <laughs> I don't use my external flash on my SLR very often because I can control the exposure unlike on my point and shoots, but it gives you a whole new look that's fun to experiment with. You can try cross-processing, which is when you use the chemistry for a different type of film's development on the type of film that you're using, and you get some really nice results. I wouldn't cross-process a role that I really cared about, but if you want to try something new and get a unique look on your film, then I would highly recommend it. Another tip is to learn to see in black and white. The most compelling film photos are the ones with really high contrast and beautiful light. Just remember when you're shooting film or any photography, you are painting with light. And especially with film, when it feels like I have one chance to get the shot right, I definitely prioritize my use of light a lot more. There's a lot of stuff to cover in the world of film photography and motion film as well. So if you want to delve deeper, I'll put some links in the description and I'll probably make a video on motion film in the future as well. Let me know if you liked this, I hope it was helpful, and um, I'll see you later. Thank you for watching, please subscribe and like and comment. Um, I'm still pretty uncomfortable in front of a camera, but I'm trying, but...